All right, well, um, welcome very much uh, for coming. Uh, this is the second session on this topic that the Iberian Study Group um, is sponsoring here at the center. My name is Sofia Perez, and I am the co-chair of the study group along with Sebastian um, Royo. And um, let me just tell everyone that today's panel session will be um, recorded and uh, later posted on the Center for European Studies YouTube channel. So if you um, participate in the discussion later, please be aware of that. Now, our last session uh, focused mostly on the question of Catalan grievances um, in the current um, situation in Spain and had a number of political scientists and a sociologist uh, who focused on that particular question. Today we have a panel that is composed of a prominent Spanish historian, um, Jose Alvarez uh, Junco, who is an expert both on the phenomenon of nationalism and on Spanish constitutional questions. We have a uh, political scientist, um, Jose Manuel Martinez, who is a, a, uh, an expert on European politics. And we have a political theorist, Glenn Morgan, who um, has written extensively on questions of democratic justification in uh, the European Union. So we have a, a different set of disciplines represented here. And what we're hoping to do today is both to deepen our understanding of the um, question of Catalan nationalism uh, from a historical perspective with um, Professor Alvarez Junco's participation and to broaden the um, focus out to consider the uh, implications that the situation in Spain and um, Glenn will also be talking about the current scenario in the case of Britain, uh, the implications that that has for uh, European politics. So let me just give a slightly more formal introduction of our speakers. Jose Alvarez Junco is a professor of history at the Complutense University where he chairs the department um, of social movements and political thought, is that correct? He is a former um, chair of this Iberian study group, so we are particularly pleased to welcome him back at this very important uh, time. He also held the Prince of Asturias a chair at Tufts University from 1992 to 2000. And he subsequently uh, became the head, the director of the Spanish Center for Political and Constitutional Studies from 2004 to 2008 at a time when questions of constitutional reform were uh, really beginning to be seriously uh, discussed in Spain and also during the period in which the, uh, re the last Catalan Statue of Autonomy was um, drafted. So he is able to offer us a very uh, particular uh, um, and useful point of view. Jose Manuel Martinez is a Jean Monnet professor at the European, uh, I'm sorry, a Jean Monnet professor in European politics and society at the Complutense University in Madrid. He is an affiliate of this center and he also directs the Real Colegio Complutense here 
at Harvard University, uh, which is a collaboration between the Complutense University uh, in Madrid and Harvard. Glenn Morgan is our aforementioned political theorist. Um, he was also a former faculty affiliate, faculty here at Harvard, an affiliate of the center, and he is now heading uh, the Moynihan European Union Center at Syracuse University. He is the author of a number of books, as are other members of the panel, um, but the perhaps the most important one relevant to us today is the idea of the European superstate, public justification, and European <coughs> integration. Now, um, let me just, before I let the panelists uh, take over, say that I would very much like to thank our co-sponsors for these events, and these include the Prince of Asturias Chair um, at Tufts, which helped uh, make today's event possible, and the Elcano Institute in Madrid, which helped uh, in putting together the first um, round table that we had. Okay, well, having said more than enough, I will let uh, Professor Alvarez Junco take over. <coughs> Thank you. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, let me begin by mm, apologizing for my voice <laughs> when the in the in the airplane the day before yesterday I, I caught a cold uh, and uh <coughs> I hardly have a, have any voice. It is a great great pleasure to be here. This is I consider this my home. I was here for many years and uh, I I know that Sofia and Sebastian are mm, running this uh, study group very well, and it's a pleasure to be here and to see them and to see all of you and participate in this, in this panel. As a historian, my contribution to this uh, problem, to this crisis, I have been asked to, to talk about the Catalan problem mainly, and the nationalist problem in, in Spain. And as a historian, my contribution uh, should be to analyze the present situation thinking of their origins. Hmm? and the origin and comparing the present situation with the original situation. And the origin of this problem is relatively recent against nationalist way of seeing it. It is not a medieval problem, has nothing to do with medieval kingdoms or with the wars in the 17th century, or, the, or the even the 19th century. It is basically related to the linkage between Spanish nationalism and the Franco dictatorship. Hmm? But it could be more revealing to take it back to the moment when peripheral nationalisms emerged more than one century ago, more or less one century ago, one and, one and 20, uh, 120 years ago. Mm? Remember the Spanish situation at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th. Mm? Was, um, Spain was a country plagued with a series of chronic problems. It was the one of the most, the most unstable states or countries in Europe. In an extremely unequal distribution of wealth, mm, the agrarian reform was badly needed, Praetorianism, mita military intervention in Spanish politics, church-state intervention, there was an, an enormous uh, mm. intervention of the church in the, in the or influence of the church, uh, Catholic church in the public sphere. There was a problem of illiteracy, the public educational system was, in, there was almost a total failure the, the only educational system that was in the hands that worked was in the hands of the Catholic Church. And to all this, regionalism and nationalism were added, particularly in relation to the Catalan case. Only the Basques would become very important in the, in the later Francoism, the later part of Francoism. Barcelona and Bilbao were the two industrial centers, and they were subjected to the economically more retarded center, that was Madrid. As a result of the political instability mm, that lasted nothing less than 170 years from 1808 to, 1808 to 1978, 170 years, in Spain there was the inability to create common symbols and references such as the flag, 
or the national holiday or the or the national anthem. The, there was a serious economic backwardness compared to the most advanced European, European powers, mm, with a couple of industrial islands, Barcelona and Bilbao. And there was international irrelevance, mm, painfully brought to light by the 1898 crisis, by the Spanish-American-Cuban war. Mm. And yet, there was a constant feature, a kind of permanent structure in Spanish political and social life that was the clientelistic system, typical of rural Spain. It was also typical of other Mediterranean countries, such as Italy and Greece, and we can see that today still alive. Eh? Uh, clientelism was the, is the opposite to individualism and, and the opposite to the free market. Some people control certain key political and economic resources and distribute them as favors among their followers. As a result, an individual or citizen is not valued for his or her work or his, eff his or her effort or skills, but for his or her connections, hmm? the family to which you belong. Hmm? 75 years later, 1975, at General Franco's death, many things had changed. During the later Francoism, there was an economic takeoff, a profound secularization of Spanish society, a rural migration, rural Spain practically disappeared, and the agrarian problem practically disappeared, but not everything had changed. The most relevant problem that remained since the 1930s or the beginning of the, of the century was the regional problem, the territorial structure of the state. And there were some other traits of the inherited political structure that still remain not so grave as they were before. But they, for instance, Catholicism, or that is clientelism, mm, as the behavior of the political parties in democracy will reve reveal later. As a result of the modernizing changes, the transition to democracy in Spain was relatively smooth. There was an elite agreement, mm, not only between left and right, but also between central elites, Madrid elites, and peripheral elites. Spanish nationalism was then tainted with a certain lack of legitimacy because of its close association with the dictatorship, the Franco's dictatorship. And political parties of the left, as the Socialist Party or the Communist Party or the myriad of revolutionary tiny uh, groups were obsessed with having to pay some kind of a debt to the nations without a state and repeated the mantra of the determination of the peoples. Mm. The Transitions Pact led to a very unstable constitutional solution in this field, but perhaps not unstable, but a very, mm, very funny constitutional solution in this field. It was not an agreed compromise between centralism and federalism. It was the acceptance of both nationalistic claims, Spanish and peripheral. On the one hand, the Spanish Constitution establishes quite clearly that Spain is the sole existing nation and the only bearer of sovereignty. On the other, it recognizes the existence of regions, of pueblos de España, peoples of Spain, and guarantees the right to autonomy, whatever that is, of its nationalities, the new words that didn't exist in in Spain before, nationalities and regions. So they speak of nationalities, pueblos, peoples, and regions, without establishing clearly which is the difference between one or and the other. Uh, two categories were established of autonomous regions and communities. One of them was going to have more autonomy and the, one, and the other one less, and, and later on, mm, autonomy. The first one was supposed to be, quite clearly, Catalonia, the Basque Country, and Galice. But the Socialist Party, because of um, the, their electoral strategy, strategy, pushed for Andalusia. It was their stronghold to be also one of the, the most important, the most privileged autonomous regions. So, and all the others began to do the same. So in the end, we have 17 autonomous communities without any difference between uh, any of them. There are other problems of the 1978 Constitution. Uh, I, can, I don't have the time to deal with them. We, ca we, can, we can talk about that uh, later on in the, in the debate. 
Now, almost 40 years later of the, Spanish, of the transition to democracy after General Franco's death, the situation of the late 1970s has again been altered by new factors. Mm? In a spectacular economic growth in 1980s, in 1990s, I mean, in the, in the beginning of the century until 2007, yeah? uh, and uh, um, democratic development, which is much more balanced than the Italian development, for instance, there is no such a big difference between the north and the south in Spain as, as, as it was, and Spain is no, uh, in Madrid is no longer the um, agrarian village that used to be at the beginning of the 20th century. It's the economic, industrial, and financial center of the country, really. Mm. A democratic system has been established and consolidated. Mm. A an important part of the political change after Franco's death has been a far-reaching devolution process Spanish state was one of the most centralized in Europe in 1975 and has evolved towards a semi-federal system. Mm. On the other hand, Spain has joined in uh, NATO, the European Union. It is not a big power, but still is a middle, mm, middle range power, mm, uh, fairly res respectable, let's say. A very important aspect in recent evolution of Spanish society is the radical change in migratory flows. Today, Spain is a country of immigration, and the proportion of foreigners has grown to more than 10% of the population in less than 20 years. And this new reality changes everything in terms of nationalism, because uh, it is not, uh, we will talk about that later, but in Spain there is not the problem of um, ethnic communities with rivalries, nothing to do with the Balkans. It is not that Catalan speakers and Castilian speakers do not intermarry, do not speak to each other, they, they clash when they meet in a, in a, in a pub or, or in a bar, nothing like that. Has there has never been one of those uh, problems in Spain. It's a problem of elites, of distribution of power and resources between elites. On the other hand, nationalism has been linked in recent decades with backwardness, which is the periphery of Europe where you, you find these problems in the former Soviet Union, for instance, with wars, with terrorism in Ireland or in Spain with the ETA, the terrorist group linked to, to, to Basque terrorism. And there are some other factors that seem to work against a nationalistic future. It doesn't seem to be the right moment to plan the creation of new sovereign states with all the required political power to regulate their own internal order and to control their external relations. In the new situation in the, in the economic, uh, in, in the European Union, it has seen that to have a nation state is so important uh, because nation states are losing competences and they, they are losing power and sovereignty uh, in favor, uh, in, in relation to the, to the European Union and in relation to their regions in the Spanish case. And still, the problem is certainly alive and has been exacerbated by the September 11th demonstration in Barcelona. Mm. You know, September 11th is not the, is, is a date, a very important date, or 9-11th is a very important date for Americans because of other reasons, but in, in Catalonia, it is the national day. The, when they remember when, when Barcelona was conquered in, in the 18th century by Spanish troops in, a, in the war of Spanish succession. <coughs> Mm, a political system, even a post-national reality, needs to be built on pre-existing cultural identities. The subject, subject of sovereignty must be defined, eh? and in relation to the identity of the sovereign subject, in present Spain lacks a clear definition and strength. There is a lack of symbols, of emotional factors. Think of the problem the, uh, the of writing the letter, the words for the national anthem. Mm. Spanish national anthem is the only one in the world that has no words, only music. That is impossible to agree eh, because of the political dissensions of the 19th and 20th century to agree about what to praise the national anthem. If we praise the conquerors and the discovery of America and the conquest of America, well, of course the left wouldn't accept it, uh, or the defense of the Catholic religion. If we praise freedoms and, uh, and the federal strategy of uh, the right wouldn't accept it. So it's very difficult to find the words that could be agreed by everybody. So there, mm, 
Spanish um, nationalism has to appeal to constitutional patriotism, and that is too cold, mm? the same as Europeanism is cold. Peripheral nationalists are the opposite. They raise emotions. They, they are based on primary needs and attachments of belonging, land, language, the suffering motherland, and this is very efficient. Mm? It is a communitarian discourse. It's horizontal rather than vertical loyalty. And there is even a certain hypertrophy of symbolism. Uh, of course, we enjoy the advantage of educational and cultural powers. Even the newly created autonomous, autonomous community, which were practically invented 30 years ago, such as Rioja or Cantabria or Murcia, eh, Madrid itself, that is a, a, com a autonomous community, have been able to create symbols and identities internalized by their constituencies. But as I said, there is no ethnic problem in Spain, no rivalry between, between community, communitarian groups. There is a rivalry between the cities, between the Madrid and Barcelona, the two major cities of the country, and the elites, the Madrid elites and the Barcelona elites who struggle for getting more power and resources in the, in the Catalan case for Barcelona, more independence in relation to Madrid, where the center, the political center is located and basic decisions are made. There's a funny situation in Catalonia where the political elites do not reflect the complexities of society. Mm. Uh, in, in Catalonia, Catalonia is a very mixed uh, society where you have many people, more than 50% or around 50% who speak Castilian. There are many people whose uh, names are Garcia or Perez or Gutierrez, typical Castilian, Castilian names. And those people are not in the Catalan parliament. 50% hmm? or more than 50% of the language that you hear in the, in the streets of Barcelona is Castilian speak. In the Catalan parliament, of course not. You only hear Catalan. So there's a kind of uh, success of the nationalist uh, discourse and the nationalist, uh, nationalist image that has, has won the, the market, the political market in, in this case. Present day Spanish society is much more complex and changes much more quickly than what establishes established discourse indicates. Hmm? Uh, and in the end, I think that peripheral nationalists will have to admit the complexity of reality. Hmm? See the results of the Catalan elections in last November. Uh, there was um, after the enormous success of the demonstration of September 11th. The Catalan nationalists thought that it was the proper time for independence. And then they made their campaign with la voluntad de un popular, hmm? the, the will of a people. There's a people, and there's one will. Hmm? You see the results. And the result is at least seven political groups, more or less, have the market distributed. Some of them are nationalist, Catalan nationalists, some others are more Spanish uh, inclined, some of, of them are right, others are left. So it's a very complex society. There is not one people and one will, certainly. Mm. And I guess that in the end they will have to admit this this complete this this uh, reality. Mm, they tend to say that Spain is plural, and you don't want to admit that. You Spanish nationalists don't want to admit that. Certainly, Spain is plural, but Catalonia is also plural, and you Catalan nationalists don't want to admit that. So, so we all are plural, and in the end, we will have to we will have to reach some kind of, uh, of agreement. Uh, apart from that, Spanishness is stronger than it seems. Hmm? Banal nationalism linked to economic performance or sports victories are demonstrating that now with the soccer World uh, Cup and the European cup eh, for Sp I mean Spanish flags have appeared in the streets, thousands and thousands of Spanish flags. And this is something that my generation could not understand because the Spanish flag, flag was linked to the Franco dictatorship. And we uh, don't feel very, sh very safe when we have a Spanish flag uh, um, protecting us. So, but no new generations seem that have changed that and that's very important. Thank you. Thank you. While the present economic crisis has added a few more negative traits to the, to the situation, 
I'm not going to enter the, in the economic crisis because this, this is your problem. The, certainly, the Spanish m international image has suffered a very serious m blow. I remember in 2006 or 2007 when the political philosopher Philippe Petit used to come to, to, to Madrid. He came at least twice. And uh, he used to praise the President Zapatero as an example of um, Republican culture. And uh, Spain was evolving in a, in, a, in a way that is going to be the model for other Western societies. Mm? It is not that. The imagine, the, the imagine that we have now is more linked to economic problems, to corruption, and to mm, some, other, some other negative, very negative traits. To sum up and to conclude, what is Spain headed for? Well, the horizon is, is open, the same as always. It could happen one of these three things. Could be a, one, a volcanic fragmentation, the breakup of the Spanish state into smaller sovereign units. Mm. This would be a tragic, probably, scenario. Mm. But the logical culmination of, of the aspirations of the uh, nationalism uh, could it could happen that there were there was some kind of war, uh, military could uh, intervene, uh, could be some uh, ethnic cleansing, some reprisals, etc. It doesn't seem foreseeable at present, but it is not impossible. The second possibility is the evolution towards a federal system. There should be, in that case, a clear and stable distribution of powers, a clear, clear assumption of costs and resources, and the participation of regions and autonomous communities in central institutions. Mm. And all these, of course, would require a broad consensus between all political parties, uh, which is unthinkable today. Mm. The third and most likely option is that the current situation is prolonged for decades, mm, with some additional features, probably. Multi-ethnic multi complexity, because of the, uh, the new society with immigrants that would require to change uh, quite a few things, and with the disappearance of ETA violent activity. Terrorism has practically vanished at this moment, and ETA seems to follow the path of uh, uh, the IRA in the, in the Ulsters. But discourses about threatened identities should also be tuned down, which is un unlikely, given the need nationalists have of feeling to be the victims. Eh? It is the responsibility of the elites who behaved in such an innovative and moderate way during the transition, and nowadays seem decided to foster primary intentions. In the end, Spain has been able to overcome more difficult crises than the present one. We will see. Eh? Thank you very much. This is supposed to be my presentation. Uh, well, it's, 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 it's um, actually an honor to be here, and it's actually unbelievably lucky to have such a Jose's presentation that he put the main, I would say, cornerstone for any presentation on this topic. Spain is complex, and Spain and Catalonia have different sensibilities, and Spain and Catalonia is about shape of race. So everything trying to understand the Catalan, the Basque, the Spanish, historical process or current reality mm, and try to do it in a binary white and black a scenario is, is probably is not going to have the right vision. There's a, a basically a, a need for interpreting many grades, shades of grades, and eventually we might be successful or not because it's a really complicated issue, but still, if we understand that this is a really complex society and these are really complex process, what is going on right now in Spain, and uh, Spain includes, of course, 17 autonomies, many of them with a really strong historical and uh, cultural heritage, and of course, our um, pretty much strong presence and, and actually will of, of building a future in the European Union are elements essential to, to try to understand these Catalan projects, uh, and of course, the Spanish or global state reaction towards that. So I uh, would propose to start with uh, some reflections on what actually uh, Catalan thinks about identity 
And the data that I will bring here are from the from the CIS, that is the, the state uh, official organism dependent on the on the parliament to to actually to bring the data. Uh, so any official data are public in the webpage of the of the CIS. So if, if you will go to 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 in blue Spain or Catalonia uh, in in red. And, and the reason why I can explain afterwards why there's no uh, disaggregation for every survey of the seas, but this is not the, the, top the topic. But anyway, I will try to, to bring always the, the newest data that the, the seas put. Is that, well, that reflects a uh, complex society. So you will ask, uh, how do you feel? Well, the people living in Catalonia feel as Spaniard as Catalan or more Catalan than Spaniard, but it's like uh, this sharing feeling of belonging is stronger than, than only, only Catalan. Uh, if we will ask, and, and that's what the city is here, about that what do you mm, want from your, from your autonomy, from your institutions, mm, there's a, a group of variety between those who want the same autonomy, or they want a stronger autonomy, or a weaker autonomy, that would feel comfortable with this uh, system where we have right now. And this important, and this you have to have in the count, these are really recent survey. This is a really strong person right now that they are answering that they would like their institution to think of the level of, of, of stealing in a context of possible independence. It doesn't mean that they want independence in this question, but that they actually would like the institution, Catalan institution, be able of run. See, if we have this complex uh, society uh, and we have many tools, but a really important tool is that, of course, the, the constitution that, that we will go afterwards in the Statute of Autonomy and, of course, the primary law of the European Union and, and, and secondary law too. Many see uh, the Spanish constitution as a straight jacket. And there are others that think that it's an ending test. It's, it's a constitution for 100 years, as many have said, that has proved our living together for since the transition for almost 40 years, as has been said before. But they basically just need a small modification if needs some, and there are others that will consider that this is a building process and that eventually we, uh, like in many founding fathers said, here and there, it should be eventually reviewed in the need of times. Uh, and here, facing the review that I will do afterwards, we have two visions. One that has been said by many leaders and the, the current prime minister of Spain that has said that we want to open the reform of the constitution if we don't know where we are going. And we, we have to know what he means, but who, who, we are, who should know? Because if citizens should know, then eventually we should think if they are willing to open a reflection. And I think it's the reflection that will be one of, the, of my points here and conclusions that I say before I forget it, is that we, we shouldn't focus this reflection only in a, in a multi-dimension Catalonia, Spain, but of course in a project of the European Union uh, that is actually where, where almost uh, every, every Catalan, every Spaniard wants to be, at least to the, the Troika uh, start playing a role. See, uh, actually Jose previously has already indicated this process, so I can jump on it. So the Spanish constitution open up uh, a process for accession of autonomy. He explained really well why there were historical communities and then in the end, Andalusia joined and then the rest joined and why we have right now almost an equal step for a scenario for the 17 um, autonomy is the of the fact that in the beginning there was a two tracks. And what it turned out from, from the Spanish constitution and the section that this actually were the distribution of powers between the central state and the autonomous communities uh, are developed, is that we have a, a complex system. We have a multi-level uh, constitutional system, a multi-level legislative system, and basically the result is the, the, the Supreme Court, the, the constitutional court, we, we as you know in many countries in Europe we, we have a constitutional legality control in separate bodies, ha played a, a really essential role that actually I think has some importance in what had happened uh, recently with, uh, with the last uh, period of the relationship between uh, uh, and the Catalan institutions and, and, and the central institutions. So as uh, been already said, we have 17 autonomous communities, Catalonia among them, with basically right now with the same sort of competences. So this is what is called coffee for everybody, cafe para todos, what is in the end this process and then being. 
if we go to sort of describe from a scholarly point of view what actually uh, this system is, mm, well, Spain for many, uh, this España that we see there with this weird word there, uh, we will see that it's doing pretty well if we compare it with a federal state like the United States, Canada, or s Switzerland, uh, though not as good as Germany. Belgium is a really, really peculiar case. Uh, uh, it's doing pretty well so far, self rule or let's say the capacity of self government of the autonomous community. And it's, new in, and it's not doing that well if we actually analyze which is the role that autonomous institutions, autonomous community institutions, and even uh, population uh, will play through the uh, Catalan institutions in or other autonomous communities in the Madrid institutional central institutions. So our Senate is not like the Bundesrat in, in, in Germany, it's not like the, the, the US Senate. This is one of the things that have been many said that this is a need of reforming the Senate. I do believe this is one of the needs. And we also have a monarchy that this played a role uh, really important for many people, but it is true that we don't have uh, a head of a state that helps to mobilize uh, electorally, politically, uh, and, and we don't have, let's say, a democratic leadership in that sense. So those two factors are those that will put Spain down in this quarter and not up with Germany or as, as high as the United States uh, will be. If we go to money, and I heard that euros or dollars is important in these issues, uh, and, and, and others too, Mm, well, Spain is not doing that, but if we compare with Germany and Belgium, so far, mm, decentralization of spending, uh, if we, we put it together with Germany or, 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 or Belgium that we saw were far ahead in, 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 in so far uh, central mobilization of the uh, interest in, in central institution is concerned. Mm, uh, we were doing bad in relation with those here. We are not doing, we are not doing that bad, as you can see. And of course, if we go in comparison with the European Union, or if we go to the OCDE, and we look over there, I hope that you can see Spain and, and Germany are pretty, pretty much in the same in the same league. And then we come to the point that this is a pretty fascinating um, issue from the last three years, four years in Spain in this debate: the fiscal deficit, or what properly in political proper terms would be the interregional fiscal flows. And why 2005? Because the only time that has been from the central government study about these figures. It was in 2005 and it was published, as you can see here, and it, you can find it on the web page in 2008. So all the data that may come afterwards, it come from another institutions, uh, they simply don't have the data. So the reflection about that will be first, there's a lack of transparency for the central institution in that. The justification in order not to have a open or yearly or, or, or whatever periodically uh, mm, issues about this data is that they basically mm, didn't want to, 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 to put oil into this debate about who is paying more or who is not paying more. The, they, they, the philosophy is that we have a solidarity system in Spain. So what basically you see here in red is door that are netto contributors to the whole country in, in include those that are netto recipients. So mm, this is, as I said, from, from uh, 2005. So you will see that uh, the autonomous community of Balears is the one who that year had by far, let's say, the less resort, Western Catalonia. And then Madrid right now, with, with the, let's say, the, uh, an unofficial data, it will be right now having a, a stronger deficit than Catalonia because it's a very economic situation. Well, but here there's a lot, a, a, a huge debate about it. But basically, the situation that Catalonia is demanding is to have the same situation that the Basque Country and Navarre will have. And what is argued on the other side is that the whole system of redistribution won't be able of, of actually working out as it's been doing during mm, this uh, period of democracy with, that, with changing the distribution. If we go and we see the, the, the evolution of the distribution of household income, we will see that and I, 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 I will suggest you to, for instance, focus on the Basque Country, that is this one. And, and it has a, a stable and, and, and according with Catalonia, favorable uh, fiscal system from the very beginning of the transition. It's done worse during the industrial and in our integration in the European Union and, and the traditional industry has to be dismantled and it made pretty well afterwards. We see Extremadura, that, that you see is the, the poorest region and it's the one, if we go back, that is receiving more let's say, funds from the, 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 the Spanish redistribution. Well, it's slowly, slowly you catch the monkey, but it's a, a structural improvement there. So 
uh, one of the reasons to, to, to argue against this fiscal balance uh, uh, or seen in, in, in terms of deficit is that pretty much is related with wealth, with individual wealth, uh, income, and of course, activity through indirect taxes, and of course, uh, where the headquarters of main business firms are, are asserted in Spain. And not so much in terms of, of regions, but mm, of course, the argument against that is that, well, if wealthy people are here, we want to do better services here, so we, the more money we have, the more services we are gonna do. Of course, this is a never ending debate, but to put it in, 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 in simple terms, that would be about it. Probably you heard that there was a new statute in, in, in Catalonia. One of the things that, that many may think is if it was a recent statute approved in 2006, why, why we have so soon already this, this constitutional crisis? Which is, it wouldn't make, make sense. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, we have that Catalans were uh, reasonable uh, satisfied with the, with the result of the, of the, of the statute and the referendum. That's basically what you can see here. And they considered it was good uh, and for Spain and good for Catalonia. And, and that was basically what happened in 2006 when the three party that there was uh, the previous government to this one promote a, a, a new statute that by the way had the, the support, majoritarian support of all, uh, basically all the, the members of parliament in, in both in, in, in Madrid, in, in, in the Spanish parliament and in Catalonia. What if we go to the um, the support in the in the in the election for the statute, and I compare it with the Spanish Constitution? I know this is a completely different context, but it's the only referendum we have on the Constitution, because the two amendments weren't put on ratification, as I will explain later on. See, the turnout I would say wasn't that great. What this is one of the criticisms is that, and eventually we can relate it with the statement that that Jose put, and I think I know I, I interpreted it mistakenly, is that. There's a debate, and it was put actually here in the first panel we, we had here about the, the Spanish constitutional crisis. There was a, a huge debate about the if this is a process f uh, top down or down top. And, and what they, they would argue is that this turnout for the, for the statute implies that they were the elites, the, the political parties elites, those who wanted an statute, no, 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 the, the Catalonian citizens. And well, once we go into the, 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 the election, actually the support for, for the statute was big. And that was the support of the, of the, of the Catalan for the Spanish Constitution. It doesn't mean that it's gonna be an ever-ending support for the Spanish Constitution, but in the Basque country you will have 50%. This was not at all the case. There was a member of the, of the of Convergencia, you know, Miquel Roca, you name a member of the founding father groups, and, and, and he was pretty much in, in the process. Uh, that will basically si simplify the, the, this sentence that Puyol has said in, in, in some meeting, close meeting, that the, that the bus went for the, for the money, and but they were for the culture. And now it seems that this is the, the, the issue of the money now came to. Uh, so what went wrong? If we have in, you know, so few years later uh, and this uh, conflict, I mean, this success with the Estatute, and, and now we have this conflict. Well, basically, Mm, and, and I have five minutes left. See, mm, there was, a, uh, uh, after the referendum and all this support and all this negotiation, there was a, 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 a constitutional challenge by the Popular Party, and there was some parts, uh, uh, some symbolic, you know, not so that symbolic, and some more material that were overruled and considered unconstitutional. So the result, to make a long story short, was that they the, the, the expiration of Catalonia didn't fit in the Constitution anymore. Of course, there's been little pedagogy and little explanation and little leadership from both parties, one in person and one not, explaining actually how this constitutional process works. And, and of course, there's also here uh, revisions of the, of, the, of the amendments of the states in the United States, in other countries too. But it turned out that nobody really explained that to, 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 to the population, so everybody expected that, of course, the Constitutional Court should basically bless whatever it comes. Actually, the Prime Minister Zapatero said that, that will bless anything that comes from the Department of Parliament. That was probably the beginning of the, of the problems of all this process. And, and it was not only that it was unconstitutional in some important points, but it was also that they take really a lot of time to, to solve this question. There was a lot of, mm, definitely, 
going on uh, news about the constitutional court uh, in, in a really, really, really not nice fight uh, for f uh, trying to get some members out of the court because they made previously opinions about the st statute when they were professors. So that was a really, really long, long, too long process and didn't, I won't say that the constitutional court had his best moment in that, mo in that time, in that particular ruling. And um, after, right after, or together with, uh, with the statute ruling, we have uh, uh, an election, and then Convergence Union, that has been the, the governing party most of the time, came to, to office again. And then it happened, the process that actually Jose told, uh, uh, expl explained really nicely. And so they said, this is the moment. And when it came the moment, this is the result that actually he was explaining. Convergence Union, there was the one who said, this is the moment for, for going to put it in our agenda for first time in history, the independentism, then it drops in, in seats, it drops in votes with a, a stronger turnout. And some people even thought that Arthur Mas was going to resign. And that wasn't the case. And there was a, an agreement with the Esquerra Republicana Catalunya, this has been traditionally the, the, indep the independence party that, that you can analyze was actually one of the, the, the parties that really, really increased. But uh, Jose put two ideas. One is that multi-party system and a bigger turnout uh, in both directions uh, with, uh, with the topic of independentism. Well, what this, this agreement between Esquerra Republicana and Convergencia said, well, we have to ask the people about independence. And if you go to the, to the parties, they will, they will say, you go here, and of course, they, they think Esquerra Republicana voters and, and Convergencia voters think that they, they are the ones to decide and not the whole <laughs> entity. And then again, I want to, to recall what I already said about this idea of mm, the right to decide. So they came out with these questions, uh, well, let's call it independence question, that was put before the, 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 the body, the, 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 the Council of Statutarian Guarantees. And well, this, this question, Sebastian and Sofia, I think would be just for a third panel. If we, we, we could make a third panel up just about this question. If first, if we can have a, 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 a constitutional independent democracy and social state integrated in the European Union, uh, I think that right now is a part of the of the debate. But probably, what I, I was supposed to bring here, if you give me some mo a couple of minutes, Sophia, was to to bring the European Union topic. That, that eventually, the next panel is going to focus on that. So I just uh, may escape. But basically, if you, if they want to send this question and they are expected people to press it, you are going to have uh, immediate integration of the European Union after the secession. This is not legally nor politically true. And, and <coughs> well, if you go to analyze the, the, the criteria, and if we go to history, we'll see that this is the average accession, accession process. And of course, in the case of Catalonia, in, since the key community has been already implemented for many years, we will be in a case of Finland. And well, we couldn't speak afterwards because uh, do we have this negotiation like Catalan and Spain, as you know, but we don't have constitutional courts. So if you want me to, to say, I, I, just, I just sum up. If we look at the uh, precedents, uh, there's not a case like, like the one in, in Catalonia because those that leave a country didn't want to be part of the union. And those that have a fast track like the, the German Democratic Republic, they, they, they came into the European Union through through a uh, uh, German agreement, so let's say becoming part of a member state. So there's no, there's no, there's no unprecedented. What we do know is that in the end, if you want to know if there's a fast track or not, you better ask the, the, the European Council, uh, because this is where, where definitely what the treaty said. And for that, I think it's not the best of the moments right now. First, because uh, the Lisbon Treaty include this provision among others for interest of the Spanish government. And if every time that the, the, the commission is being asked about that, what, what if said, we are a member of a state and we are here to join, not to, to divide. So what, what, what do you expect to say for the European Union? Uh, let's let's bear it that member state handle with their own issues. And we, of course, are not going to be in generally in favor of the board. In the first panel, and, and I just uh, quote uh, our colleague there, Professor Molina, Mm, he just brought these this possible uh, countries being against the, the Union. Uh, uh, I finished uh, just saying that in the end, of course, the European Union is not, is not going to be the solution. If it's uh, an agreement like the, the British one eventually in Spain, 
eventually with an embedded system, of course, the European Council will work in a different way, and the whole process will work in a different way. But we, we can say that, that the European Union is not even going to try to solve the problem. The problem is in, in Spain, in Catalonia, and that is what it has to be solved. If you ask me, of course, uh, my, my, my solution is that uh, well, a, a global constitutional process, not the one that is dealing with the only with the Catalan issue, but with many issues that are local in the Spanish system, the, the, the Consell de Garantias uh, Estatutarias in Catalonia already said that the Catalan institution don't have the, comp the competence to do so. So or we can do the, the plan A that already failed with the Catalan uh, Estatut, or we do the plan B, that is the referendum as is being planned by Convergencia, the current government, the current majority, but this is is basically basically illegal. So it's gonna it's gonna come into uh, confrontation of Spain. So or, or we try to go and yesterday the Prime Minister of Spain actually invited the, prime, the, the president of La Generalitat to come to the Congress to expose this plan, and and, and why not to to reflect about reforming the, the Spanish institution in a global process. So mm, this is the the end. But I just I just say uh, goodbye in in I have a somewhere goodbye in in Catalan. So muchas gracias and thank you so much. I'd like to thank uh, Sophia Perez for inviting me and organizing this uh, very interesting panel. And uh, my talk really uh, picks up where the previous panelists left off. And uh, I'd like to look at the question of uh, secession uh, from a broader European perspective. And um, I think the first thing to note here is that uh, for much of the post-war period, national minorities have looked on the European Union with particular favor. They thought that uh, Europe provided national minorities with an answer to a question that's always posed to them. How can you possibly secede? You're too small. Um, well, the national minor minorities, this is true of the Scots, this is true of the Catalans, this is true of the Welsh, this is true of the Basques. They would say, well, we might be small, but we can survive within Europe. Europe offered them a, an opportunity to break away from their their co-nationals, the larger co-nationals who, in nationalist rhetoric, oppressed them, ignored them, exploited them. In Europe, they could survive. Um, I think that view that Europe provides a particular uh, advantage to national minorities and uh, helps uh, secessionist movements has, like much else that's gone on in Europe today, had to change given the events of 2008, 2010. I think it's no longer uh, clear that the European Union makes life easier for secessionist movements. Actually, I think it's the opposite. I think the European Union makes it much harder. Now, I think a full analysis of that, uh, of that problem would require us to look at um, the economic dimensions of secession, the legal dimensions of secession, the political dimensions of secession, and the philosophical dimensions of secession. Now, I'm most interested in the philosophical dimensions because I'm a political philosopher, but I will uh, begin by going briefly through the other ones. Let me first begin with the economic dimensions. Um, I think the events of the, in the Lehman crash and then the, the Eurozone crisis has made uh, secession much more problematic than it was uh, prior to 2008. I think uh, a number of factors have uh, explained this. One. I think any movement towards secession will trigger a further decline in, uh, in or a rise in, in bond prices. Markets do not like to be disturbed and unsettled. So as secession gets closer, the economy, let's use Spain as an example, the, e the economy of Spain will get worse. You will see a crisis comparable to the crisis you saw in uh, the summer of last year. Secondly, the, uh, the econo Eurozone crisis has made things more difficult because the southern European countries in particular are heavily in debt. Now, anyone who's been divorced a few times knows that it's much more difficult to divide up debts than it is to divide up assets. And 
when you have to divide up assets, uh, when you have to divide up debts, you're going to get into some very tricky uh, questions. Thirdly, I think one of the things that Euro the Eurozone crisis has made clear is that being a small country and having a small banking sector is not advantageous. Um, this is an issue that the Scots have been wrestling with for a long time. The Scottish nationalist leader, Alex Salmond, would always talk about Ireland. Ireland's doing fabulously well, he would say. If only we could be an independent nation like Ireland, we would do as well as Ireland. Ireland is the promised land. After 2007, he no longer says that. He now, when, when he gets very angry if you ask him about all the things he said about Ireland, he now starts talking about Norway. Norway is the place that we will model ourselves on. Uh, that's the, the promised land. Now, of course, Norway isn't in the European Union, <laughs> um, and, but he's, he's subtly moved from talking about Ireland to talking about Norway. Um, upshot is, I think, post-2008, uh, economically, the economic situation makes secession much more difficult. Now on to the, the legal dimensions of secession. Um, as the previous panelists said, there is no legal precedent for a European Union country seceding. That's very important. That's the most important thing. Because the question becomes, do other states want to have this as a precedent? And this is going to become a very important issue because it's not clear who is going to uh, make it to the secessionist finishes, finishing line first. Would it be Scotland or would it be uh, Catalonia? They're both having referenda in 2014. But whoever makes it to the finishing line first, the other countries are going to have a chance to block that. They're going to, so for example, if the Scots wanted to secede and they had to ask permission of the European Union to do so, there would be a very strong incentive for the Spanish government to veto it. Likewise, if the, if the Catalans made it first, the Scots, the British government, would have a, uh, a strong desire to veto it. They don't want to establish a precedent. Because once you establish a precedent, it's likely to spread elsewhere. And you can think of other places in Europe where once secession becomes a possibility, it then becomes a political card that different groups can play. Think, for example, of Perdania, the Northern League in Italy's uh, states that they want to create, they too will be able to say, oh, well, if the Catalans or the Scots have done it, why can't we? More specifically on the legal question, I think that there are three basic options that the, uh, the European uh, courts will, will uh, have to consider when Scotland, or if Scotland and Catalonia apply for, for uh, membership. One, they might have to say that... Uh, Catalonia, I'll use the example, I'll take Catalonia as my example. One option is to say that Catalonia is a new state that must seek new membership anew while Spain will retain the rights, the obligations, and uh, membership of international bodies. Um, that, I think, is the most likely uh, scenario. The second one, and this is the favorite of the nationalists, is that both Catalonia and Spain will automatically inherit the rights, obligations, and membership of international bodies. So they won't need to go through a long approval process. It will all just be automatic. And the third option is that Catalonia and Spain will both become new states, and they will both have to apply for membership in the European Union. Um, this is a possibility that, uh, that the British government are particularly wor worried about because the British United Kingdom of Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Wales signed up for membership of the European Union. If Scotland secedes, that entity doesn't exist. So it would be the United Kingdom of what? England, Wales, and um, the Wales, if Scotland secedes, then the Welsh are likely to follow suit. So there is one nightmare scenario of, of, of some people is that, that all these entities will no longer automatically qualify for international, <laughs> international bodies. It's likely, though, that the that the law courts will say that Catalonia is a new state and then it will have to apply. Um, clearly, it won't go through automatically, as, as the uh, previous uh, panelists said. Um, there's a whole range of legal issues that will have to be addressed. And politically, um, as the EU is currently constituted, 
any country that supplies for membership will have to be approved by all 27 or 28 if Croatia goes in members. One country could, which could veto it, which is, I think, uh, key. And, um, and then you'd have to settle um, things like um, what happens to the derogations that have been negotiated by the previous uh, uh, entity. For example, the British have, have negotiated an exemption from the monetary union Will that exemption also apply to Scotland if it goes through? According to existing EU uh, law, any uh, member of the, or future member of the European Union has to accept uh, membership in the monetary union. So all sorts of problems arise uh, legally. Um, politically, the, the problems are just as great. Um, one of the generalizations that you could make about the European Union is that over the last 10 years, Europe has had a nightmare dealing with treaty change and referenda. I mean, Europe has gone very, things went very badly for Europe over the last 10 years. Once they signed the convention in 2004, I don't know what happened, it was as if someone put a spell on Europe. Because after 2004, everything went wrong. I mean, immediately afterwards, the, the, the Dutch and the French, um, and then subsequently the Irish, didn't sign the referendum they were supposed to. European leaders are terrified of treaty change. They're terrified of referenda. Any um, breakup will require more treaty change, more referenda. It is a political nightmare. Um, lastly, and this is the question I want to come to, is philosophically. I mean, philosophically, I think that we as Europeans must be interested in the question, is, uh, is secession legitimate in a state like Europe? And is secession justified? I want to draw a distinction between that question, uh, legitimacy and justification, because they're, they're two different questions. The question of legitimacy raises the question, what's the right procedure that needs to, be to, need to take place to permit secession? There is uh, one I think the existing understanding is that the right procedure is a democratic vote that requires a majority in the seceding territory. Now that is an extremely permissive procedure. The procedure that I think that uh, really needs to be debated and the, and, and the one that I would defend is a somewhat more stringent procedure according to which secession is, is legitimate when it passes a majority vote in the seceding territory, the whole territory, and Europe at large. So in order for there to be a legitimate secession, again, take Catalonia as an example, there would need to be a majority in Catalonia, a majority in the existing boundaries of Spain, and a majority in the European Union. And if it fails at any one of those levels, it is not legitimate. Now, you can say, well, that's an extremely stringent uh, requirement. Why are you um, uh, forcing uh, such, a, such a stringent requirement? Well, I think that the, the answer to that is that a secession, given what I've said of e about economics and what I've said about politics, clearly affects the interests of all Europeans. A secession is clearly going to impact the Spanish economy. It is clearly going to impact the wider European economy. A secession does not just affect the interests of members of the seceding nation, it affects the interests of the wider nation and it affects the, the interests of the wider Europeans. Therefore, I think it needs to pass a more stringent test of legitimacy. Okay, if you agree with me on my test of legitimacy, you still might ask the question, um, is secession justified? Because we've got this, if I'm right, these three levels of, uh, of voting Qua European, we still have to vote. So let's say that we've got these three levels of voting. How should you vote? How should you vote as a European in a, in a, in a case where the, the Catalans and the Spaniards seek to secede? I have a theory of justification, and according to which I think that secession is justified, not when, me when people merely want to do it. I don't think that's a sufficient justification. Why do you want us to secede? We want to do it. It'll be fun. We want to be different. That, given all that I've said about the disruption 
it uh, involves. That is an in inadequate justification. Here is what I think is a stronger justification. Secession is justified in any one of the three following cases. Number one, when the members of the seceding territory are deprived of their basic rights of the person, life, liberty, freedoms of speech, and association. And that happens to some groups. You know, think of the, the, the Kurds. You, know, you can target a group and deprive them specifically of their rights. In such circumstances, I think secession is justified. Second uh, case where I think secession is justified, when the members of the seceding territory face arbitrary discrimination that results in economic hardship and a state targets a minority and forces them into a deprived economic position, then I think secession is justified. Thirdly, when the members of a seceding territory are deprived of their right to use their language in their dealings with the state. So the right to use the language in your dealings with the state. And when your language is oppressed, uh, not just it isn't flourishing as well as you might like, but when you simply can't use it in your dealings with the state, then I think that you have a justification for secession. I'm no expert, but I don't think that is the case. None of those three things apply in either Scotland or Catalonia. I don't think that secession is justified in anywhere in Western Europe. Thank you. Very well. Thank you very much for keeping uh, with the times I had given you. And um, I'd like to see first whether there are questions from the audience, open it up to the audience for any one of our uh, panel members. Yes, and please identify yourself. I do know who you are, but everybody else does not. And my question does not relate directly to what you've been covering for me, uh, but it might sort of grow out of it. Uh, is there a possibility or is there a, any kind of uh, uh, topic of uh, justification for, in the case of secession, those members of the seceding community do not wish to secede to retain the citizenship of the original country from which they flee, as is the case, mainly Spanish nationals, while the rest of Catalonia is a free. Um, this is generally known as the problem of minorities within minorities. Yeah. It crops up, for example, in the case of Quebec, where the Cree Nation said that even if Quebec were to secede, we don't wish to. Um, I don't think, th and, and the Cree Nation were uh, geographically concentrated, so the issue of a minority, or a territorial minority within a territorial minority became um, very uh, germane to, to the debate. I don't think that there's anywhere in Europe where you get a comparable situation. It tends to be the case in the minority, the national minorities in, um, in Europe that they're sufficiently dispersed and jumbled up. And I don't think it's viable for people to have, living in the same territory, to have two different sovereigns. I mean, it's it does happen, but I don't think it's... it's I, I, I don't think that it is, uh, let's say, desirable. And I can't see, given what I've said about the justifications, why we would ever get that far in Europe because I don't think there's even a case, to, uh, a justification to trigger a, a secessionist claim. But it's an interesting question, and that does raise some complex <laughs> issues. Yes. yes, and if you could identify yourself. Yes, I'm, I'm a Catholic member. Actually, the question I asked was intending as a comment uh, on your previous question. Uh, in the case of Yugoslavia, my mother in the 50s was born in Yugoslavia. She, she kept her, her Yugoslav passport until a few years ago when it expired. So I thought that was a sort of nostalgic way that we could keep that. Uh, it didn't fall apart. It didn't fall. It was very uh, safely guarded. But my question actually was about the Balkans. And if we're fast forwarding uh, to more recent splitting, not in the case of Kosovo, but actually a little bit before the Montenegro, and how uh, if you consider. US history of the sort of 
negative press regarding regarding Serbia um, and the more positive regarding Kosovo and Montenegro that that it made the, the shift of Montenegro as an independent country that much more <coughs> that, that much more fast. I was wondering what your opinion is on how the global perception affects these political trans transitions within a country. I'm no expert on Montenegro, but it's uh, yeah, and, and it's, it's slightly different because we're talking now about recognition rather than possession. Um, which again, I would uh, I would stick quite closely to my justifications for this. Um, it's only when you can meet these justifications that you have a claim to political liberty, given the existence of such an existence. And I don't think it's as easy to apply that to Montenegro or Serbia, but maybe we could talk about that later. Um, my question is about how the evolving nature of the European Union, the European Union affects uh, this debate and uh, in a way whether it will fizzle out. Because to, uh, by the essence is to wonder, Professor Funko was saying about you know, the catastrophe or the balkanization that may ensure where the nationalists say, well, we are in Europe, uh, we will be in Europe uh, no matter what, and that will be a non-issue. But doesn't it, if that is the case in a Europe that is even more integrated than our banks are going to be integrated now, for example, uh, so the Catalonian banks are being integrated in the fiscal union, uh, what, is, what is it that the uh, nationalist cause is fighting for? Is it this, uh, this symbolism or this secession? It can't be about I mean, I understand that it can't be about self-government uh, anymore. Uh, so what is it um, that they're fighting for and uh, how will the evolution of the European, European Union into uh, what Margaret Thatcher would call the term the, the United States of Europe uh, affect that? Yes. Yeah, in principle, the, the European Union, the existence of the European Union um, is, uh, eliminates some of the incentives for, for uh, independence, because you are not exactly a sovereign independent state. This is not clear. This is basically symbolism and the fact that you are, the, instead of being the, the president of, of, a, of a region, of an autonomous community, you will be the head of a state. Uh, for, for political elites in Barcelona, it seems to be the promotion, quite clearly <laughs> promotion, but it doesn't mean that their powers are, are going to be much, much greater. And they will have an army, in principle, they, which they don't have now. And the, even armies tend to be integrated into, into, into a larger European army, you know. Uh, they will not have uh, borders. They will not have a currency. Mm? They will have uh, a flag, yes, of course, but they already have a flag. Mm? So you don't see the incentives now to become um, uh, an independent state. They, they, they are not, at least they are not so clear as they were 100 years ago. Mm? What, what I was thinking of in relation with this issue is that uh, it's, it's politically it's a really, a really key issue for the success of this movement, let's say the debate about if they will be uh, immediately joining the European Union or not. Uh, the question of where whether mm, you actually, uh, S Spain is will be eventually the one keeping the rights and then the Catalonia will start to start from zero. This is, this I think is the main point, let's say, in the political discourse. And uh, that's why the question I put, I said that this would be for a huge debate. It is actually, well, if the whole debate of Convergencia and Esquerra is not going in the sense of hey, we want to be Switzerland, we want to be uh, in, a, in a country that is not in the European Union but can make it very well, not despite of the fact that right now Catalonia has not uh, a budget approved for six months and is in a, a really strong economic struck because of course in part our pertinence to the European currency and our internal devaluation, which is right now, if Spain won't be <coughs> in the European <coughs> Union, I think won't, won't right now won't be in Switzerland in such a rough times. So 
is, is, is even not in the floor of Plitan Catalonia, this is a debate, right? Because it's not a strong debate that it should be, let's say, well, it's not such a bad, uh, in the current times of crisis, it's not such a bad scenario to be outside the European Union. The, the socioeconomic, uh, sociologic uh, support for the European Union integration actually makes that, that nobody is questioning the, 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 the world only a future within the European Union. Did you want to add to that? Um, no, I'm just having making a comment. Okay. Yes, please. Hello, everyone. I'm Professor Barano of the University of Valencia School. And I have a sort of strong argument from an area of the uh, saying it's difficult to justify this and to legitimize this, all these legal and socioeconomic arguments. Nobody is talking about the most mark. The idea is that probably that's the deepest idea. So if there is some strong argument in the positivity analysis, why don't we talk about the emotions and how we, we could solve that? Because I think that's probably the idea. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think that's what I said. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I guess what I'm, what I'm picking up maybe is that there, there's a sense really, and this is the difference from our last session, that if you can consider um, aspects of reality that include the participation in the, member u in the European Union, that it seems, uh, with the exception of this, of this view that you are beginning to hear from Esquerra, that, well, we might just leave the European Union, you know, it, having sovereignty is more important than even being a member of the European Union, that um, when you begin to consider all the realities, it seems uh, virtually impossible um, for Catalonia to achieve what at least would be proposed in the question that Convergencia was planning to propose um, originally, and I'm not sure if that is still the question, will, you know, do you, do you, are you in favor of Catalonia being an independent nation within the European Union? It just seems simply, um, you know, a road to nowhere uh, where we might go through the, we might go through the motions and the emotional pressure or the economic pressure that might be set Spain at that point would somehow lead to some sort of other negotiation between the rest of Spain and Catalonia, or I should say the central government um, and Catalonia. But that ultimate objective doesn't, doesn't really seem to be plausible. Um, and so I, th I guess that is, you know, once you take it outside of the Spanish scenario, um, it seems less and less plausible. Of course, Spain is a member state um, it's the Kingdom of Spain that signed the, uh, became a member of the European Union and presumably that would still be there. I mean, I, I suppose another question would be, you know, the question of the monarchy and, and if that were to change. But I don't, I'm not sure that, you know, the state changing its constitution would represent a problem for continued membership, you know. So it does seem, that this is, you know, thinking about the European uh, dimension kind of changes the reality of things in a big way. Um, and so then the question is, what do you do? What do you do with the emotions? And I, I'm, I'm wondering if uh, anyone would like to comment on the, my question, which would be, where are, where are these strong emotions in Spain coming from and why have they changed so much in the last, in the course of the last two years? We were offered two kinds of explanations last time. Uh, we were offered the, the explanation to do with the revision of the um, statute, um, the Catalonia's statute of autonomy by the constitutional court. And then the other explanation is that a great deal of it has to do with the economic situation. Um, so I wonder if any of you would like to comment on that. Or perhaps. <coughs> uh, I, I, I would yes. turn your, your uh, observation there actually to uh, 
into a question or an observation for my two uh, uh, fellow panelists who know a lot more about Spain than I do. Um, one of the observations you could make is that with the economic crisis of 2008 to 2010, countries that even five or six years ago uh, that looked like they were doing very well, Ireland being one example, but Spain would be another example, less so Italy. But I don't think anyone, yes, there were problems in Spain in 2006, 2007, but I don't think anyone would have predicted that things would have gone so badly as they've gone now. I think people actually in the, uh, um, because I, I'm living partly in Italy and my wife's family are all Spanish, I get to hear the stories about just how tough life is, particularly in, in Spain. And you've got unemployment there of levels which are comparable to the Great Depression in the United States. So my, my question is, is this, is did, these, did this economic crisis open up cleavages that were never properly healed. I mean, the stories, because the, 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 the gap between the left and the right in Italy, they can't even now agree on, uh, on a government, be one example. And in Spain, it seems to have opened up cleavages in the regions. Were these things that were never properly healed and that the, that the economic crisis has now brought, brought up? Or is there something else going on? I mean, to what extent is, is this a, the revenge of history? It's very difficult to say. <coughs> Economic crisis is also used as a scapegoat by, by nationalists eh? uh, the, to blame Spain for the economic crisis. If we <coughs> were not in Spain, if we were not exploited by the Spaniards, we wouldn't have the truly economic crisis. This is the implication of the message. Eh? So I'm, I'm not sure that the economic crisis is, is, it is perhaps the opportunity. There's a third factor apart from the the Constitutional Court's decision and the economic crisis, which is the disappearance of ETA, eh? the new mm, panorama in, in Spain, where nationalism is no longer linked to sovereignty and war and blood, etc. So now the Catalan model. Is so does that mean that people are more are, are more willing to associate with the argument? With, 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 with nationalist arguments. With that nationalist arguments. Yes. Our nationalist arguments are now more civilized. They are not linked to terrorism and things like that. Uh, speaking of emotions, um, the emotions in uh, among Catalan, Catalan nationalists and all Catalans are linked to language. 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 It's the Catalan language. Nothing else. That's the base of everything. If the Catalan language would have the same space in the public sphere as it has in the private sphere, I think that emotional aspect would be satisfied. Eh? In the Spanish public sphere, in the Spanish parliament, Catalan could be used. Eh? Perhaps the same eh, would be. Well, finally, a, a similar story happens between Catalan and Spanish in both public spheres. Spanish, which is 50% at least of uh, language used in Catalonia, doesn't exist at all in the, in the public sphere. And Catalan, which is an important language within Spain, doesn't exist at all in the private sphere in Spain. So perhaps we should balance that a little bit and try to recognize the multiple and complex. But the, sh the, 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 the certain consequence of it would be that other languages also would have to be represented. Of course, of course. In the, 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 s public the Senate, at least the Senate, not the lower chamber, not the parliament, but the Senate should be a chamber where you can use all languages, not only Castilian and Spanish. Yeah. And we would have, in, uh, with translations, yes, but we, we are wealthy and we, we can pay translators. We don't need them because everybody understands Castilian, but we would have to have translates, translators just for the sake of, uh, you know, um, uh, appeasing emotions. Okay. Uh, like uh, speaking of terror, uh, speaking of, of uh, you, your question, no, one, one more thing, if there are no other questions at this moment. Uh, members of a community who do not want to secede, it is not only the problem of the members, it is also a problem of the territory. Hmm? What shall we do? 
In the, in the Basque, in the Basque case, it's clearer than in Catalonia. Catalonia is divided into four provinces, but the, those are administrative provinces. They don't have many, much importance. But the Basque country is three semi-independent provinces called Federat, mm? uh, three Basque provinces. They have their own diputaciones, which is an autonomous government. It is not the Basque country. Basque country is an invention of nationalists in the 20th century. Mm? But in, in uh, historical, it has been three provinces, autonomous provinces. One of them, Alaba, is strongly pro-Spanish, pro-Spain, pro-Spanish. If we had a self-determination, independent independence referendum in the Basque country, could happen that Guipúzcoa, mm, and perhaps Vizcaya, would vote for independence. Could happen. Possibly not, but it could happen. But certainly, Alaba would vote for Spain. Mm? Say, wh what's with the vota? Will we do in that case? The two provinces would be independent, and the other one would remain in Spain. It's not only the citizens, it's also a territory. Mm? So it is in, 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 it's an impossible uh, question to solve. Mm? Some villages in Alaba, nevertheless, 90% would vote for being independent. Should we allow those villages to be with an independent Basque country? And that it's impossible. This is who, who is the one who is going to decide? To, to, to decide? Hmm? What is the subject of the decision? Hmm? It is not only European Union, Spain, and Catalonia, or the Basque country. It's also within Catalonia and within the Basque country. Provinces, cities, borders within a city, districts within a city, families. Et cetera, et cetera. So it's not an in insoluble problem to have people retain uh, their original oh, exactly. citizenship while still continuing to reside in their mother country as far yeah, as, yeah. as long as that country is part of the EU. Of course. Yeah. Okay. I suppose I might jump on Jay's question. And, yeah. and then we have one other question. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think in part of what Pepe just said is also addressing his question. What is paradoxical is if the reason is exactly why do you have such a strong independence in Catalonia and even higher in the Basque country? Because the crisis <coughs> is actually being set up for it. So there has to be other reasons besides. So the clarity is exists in both regions, the strong independence has exists in both regions, yet the, the, the development over the last couple of years has been markedly different in, between Catalonia and the Basque country. And one element that I find that is similar at the European and the Spanish level is one of the major casualties of the crisis has been the erosion of the Spanish principle of solidarity. The European Union was built around that principle and was inflamed and decreed upon. And in the case of Spain, clearly one of the manifestations of this pro-independent movement is that the Catalans don't want to support the full obedience of, of Spain. And I, I wonder what the consequences of that will be, not just at the national level, but at the European level. Because some of the historical cleverness, the, the differences among countries, um, they have also come to the surface more clearly as a result of the crisis. I just would like to do something about it. And I, I do think that, that the crisis is playing a role in the speed up to explain what happened from 2006 to, to now. There is in particular, in the Convergencia Union question, the, the, we, we really don't know. The, it depends who you ask and who you're talking, to which extent is part of a mm, negotiation, a stronger negotiation for the cupo. I mean, you, you, you don't know till where you, you get that boundary. And then in, in Convergencia Union, of course, Esquerra is the, the, the traditional uh, independentist movement. But Convergencia, I believe, Puyol for ages negotiating in a bilateral way and feeling comfortable, not even wanting a, a Senate 
it is actually Catalonia or within Convergencia we start comfortable with a bilateral negotiation is and it was never in favor of a channel like in the Bundesrat or in, in the in the states that will play short of Catalonia in the same level of the other. That was never the case, it's not the case today, it's not in the debate to reform that. But the case the new case is the is the cupo. Of course they've been a if you could explain explain the cupo. Yeah, well, well, the cupo is that mm, when I put that argument, if I mention is the, 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 the when I put that actually Catalonia is asking for the same, the same uh, uh, relationship, fiscal relationship that Basque country Navarre have in, in, in terms of, of numbers was from 8.7, the, the fiscal deficit to tr around three, the fiscal deficit is basically to have to get all uh, 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 the, 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 the taxes and then to, to give services to the region and then to give a sum that you negotiate bilateral with the with the state. So it's been more convenient. What's happening in the global uh, scenario of Spain is that of course the numbers of the Basque country and then Nav Navarre are not that uh, strong. But if you ask me, if you ask for the founding fathers, I, I, I think that that wasn't the smartest idea to put uh, a too fast track in the, in the fiscal system in Spain. <laughs> but of course that, that will be for a, for a longer debate. I, I do think they're going to be interesting that you explain part of, uh, of this movement, not in, in the language issue. Yesterday we have a new uh, demonstration for the Minister of Education that we have every now and then, not for the nation issue in the Constitutional Court. The, 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 the Parliament is the same, but they are the nation, and it's, it's, it's to my view, is more related with with that, there was a new role that there wasn't before in the in the in the roadmap of convergencia. It was, the, as, as Pepe has said already, it was the language, the culture, and now this 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 other dimension, which is brand new in historical terms. If I could say something about uh, your solidarity, which I think is very interesting. I mean, I think that you're absolutely right that one of the issues that's come up post 2010 is that uh, it doesn't seem as if Europe can survive without greater solidarity, but that solidarity isn't, isn't there. And there's a couple of generalizations you could make about that. If you wanted to be really optimistic uh, in terms of European integration, you could st say that the debate that's taking, taking place now is healthy because Europeans are actually commenting on the practices of other European countries which they never used to do. That you know, Europe is supposed to be a, something like a single entity, but people didn't really know what the pension system was or the welfare system was in different parts. Now they do, and there's a debate about are, <coughs> are, um, are Greek retirement ages too generous? I mean, if we are going to uh, transfer funds, they can't possibly have more, they can't be more generous than, w than we are. And in some respects, that's quite healthy because I think that th th this is my second generalization. People are unwilling to support solidarity when the practices of welfare are different. You have to have similar ones. In, in most countries, there's distribution between people who are in the same circumstances. If some group is, is deemed to have more, and this is, I think, very interesting development last week, the Germans have started asking questions about um, household wealth in Southern Europe. And it looks <coughs> in terms of wealth measures, the Italians and the Spaniards are wealthier than Germans because on a percentage basis, the Germans tend not to own houses. And so the Germans have said, well, they're much wealthier than us. They, uh, if you look at the how much assets they've got, they own more, so it's unfair that you're expecting us. Well, yes, we have a higher income, but they have more wealth. So, and again, the, in some respects, <coughs> this is a healthy debate. If you're going to live in the same country, if you're going to live in the same entity, which Europe is supposed to be, you have to know a lot more about what's going on. I actually think it's healthy that the Northern Europeans are criticizing Southern European uh, practices on corruption. I mean, Southern Europeans put up with a level of corruption that no Northern Europeans would put up with. And I always keep saying, why don't you complain? I mean, why don't you vote for these people? Just get it together. And uh, it's a lot of it's the Southern Europeans' fault. They just don't complain enough. 
Okay, rant well, over, sorry. <laughs> well, we do have another person who might want to ask a different question. Yeah. Uh, I was actually struck by something that I write information and some information. I mean, it's actually something that I've been following myself. So you refer to the fact that now with the Comunidades Autonomas, we actually have in Murcia, in Asturias, in effervescence in uh, development of symbols that were actually not present before. So, and, and certainly I can see that, for example, also the, the rise of nationalist parties in, say, Aragon, for example, you have the Partido Aragonesista, or in Andalusia, you have the uh, Andal uh, Andalusian party. And even in the Canaries, actually, just 15 years, uh, 10 years ago, you got Coalición Canaria in a region that actually had no nationalist tradition. So then my question for you would be, could you actually, the, the question would be, uh, if the, the system of uh, Comunidades Autónomas was actually perhaps put in place to, to dissolve, you know, um, tendencies towards nationalism from Catalonia, from the Basque country, from Galicia, <coughs> perhaps. Actually, it seems to me that the unintended consequence of the Comunidades Autónomas system has been actually to exacerbate nationalism, even in regions that didn't have nationalism, before democracy, right? So, and if that's the case, then actually, how do you solve that? It is obvious the um, the leaders of the transition to democracy thought that the Catalan and Basque problems, and perhaps the Galician problem, but it's not so much smaller, the Catalan and Basque problem would be diluted in some way if we create many communities. So if we have 17 communities, well, they are not democratic. And this, basically, this offended them, nationalists. Mm -hmm. How can we, Catalans, be compared, say, to a typical, with um, Cantabria, or Rioja, or Murcia, or Madrid itself? It is true. Mm -hmm. The much smaller, less size, mm, fewer inhabitants, and no historical tradition of, 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 of identity. That's true. Mm -hmm. Perhaps they could have accepted four communities, Catalonia, the Basque Country, Galicia, and Castile. They call Castile everything, which is unfortunate. Perhaps instead of, instead of four, it could have been five with Andalusia. Perhaps six, seven, eight, not 17, mm -hmm. certainly. It was a little bit too much. Mm. And it exacerbated the problem because they all wanted to play in the first division. Elites mm. that before didn't believe in nationalism, then as a result of all these contacts with the state that, then they actually started to see it in this idea that, oh yeah, we are an identity. Mm. And mm -hmm. then they started basically making political claims in terms of <coughs> identity. So rather than, say, uh, having the problem with you know three regions between Spain from the perspective of a Spanish nationalist, actually 20 years on the road or 35 years on the road, actually you have like 17 problems. Mm -hmm. You know, something that you wouldn't perhaps uh, want in advance, uh, you, you wouldn't have been able to uh, foresee in, in, you know, in 1980 would be that, you know, 20 years later, actually, Coalición Canaria, for example, would actually be needed in order for, for example, for the, uh, the El PSOE to govern the country, right? So, and this is basically, you know, a problem that has been created by the system itself that it didn't exist before democracy. So then, you know, it seems to me that part of the, 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 the problem here has, has been created by the system itself. Yeah, not, not in the case of the Canary Islands, though, because in the Canary Islands, in 1980, there was an independence and, and terrorist movement. Hmm? in Payac, hmm? led by uh, a certain Cubillo, who was shot, by the way, by the Spanish police. He was talking police. to a Canarian. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> that I could, I could, I could have this. Canaries, this is a very clear case of, that I know very, very closely, that where you basically see a group of people that were actually, you know, you have a communist and, you know, a fascist, are, and then a people in between, that they basically, in 1993, decided that actually if we come together as a as a nationalist party, then we will be actually able to extract more 
competencies from Madrid. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you know, this, this part has been in power in the Canada for you know, the last four or five years. And the results are actually you know, extremely extreme. Because you know, yeah. Spain is in bad shape. But the Canadians <coughs> actually had an unemployment that's actually close to 34%. And the unemployment among those below 25 years old is actually well above 50%. So, so that's why I'm saying is that you know, it, it seems to me that in the case of this region, as I could say, Comunidad Autonoma system has actually been detrimental to the modernization of this region. But the problem, at least I know, is not where the Comunidad Autonoma is based. For our law, is based on the province. It has nothing to do with the Comunidad Autonoma. And if the electoral law that gives the huge premium to the province goes to the side of the province, and, and that's what allows the nationalist party to get all the representation of the province back. So it's not the Comunidad. Uh, actually, I think uh, actually they are equal in this case. Because uh, the, the, this uh, political trend has been a really good ticket to have the dialectic center periphery. This is in Madrid. We have to be, we have to be strong in a way. Say if we establish a sort of relationship adequate, this is one way in the autonomous community. So let's be strong here to have our interest that not in infrared, <coughs> not in the headquarters of the main political parties in Madrid are going to tell what to do in Canary Islands or in Murcia or whatsoever. You think something that's going on, some, sometimes they have a seat, sometimes not. This is a little bit. And then the second thing that Sebastian put is that the province as a, as a institution actually made possible that those regional uh, nationalist parties do not have to, to actually compete for the global national scenario. but for the province ones, then to be also strong in Madrid, you will have a representation in the Congress. And that's why they never were interested in developing federal structures, despite of there's been a, a lot of talking about it. There's never been a structural nationalist attempt to create federal structures, because federal structures, by definition, despite of what Edwin said, <laughs> establish a principle of equality. So, 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 so I think both, both things uh, interact in, in I think, this too, is that the system and going to the solution, <coughs> as I put both parts in my intervention, I don't know if historical term is going to be too late, is that we, we, we do need to real more electoral and political leadership and mobilization and at a global level. So we need leaderships in terms of the debate of a global level, but I think eventually it might be too late because already the structures in the interest are creating in, in regions. And I said, of course, the Senate, a federal Senate, and of course also eventually um, um, uh, a head of the state by election or a prime minister by election during the election and not through the parliament may help in, in that process, but eventually it might be too late. Well, yeah, well, we're out of time, but we will take one last set of comments from anyone on the panel who wants to make a very, very small observation. The Canary Islands bring, brings to my mind one aspect we haven't touched here which is the international, the possible international support for a secession movement in Spain. Mm? The Empayac uh, movement tried to get the support of the United States in order to have, uh, to offer <coughs> some kind of basis, military basis in the Canary Islands in exchange for their independence. Mm? It's the only case in Spain where some, uh, there has been some intention to get international support. Nor the, neither the Basque nor the Catalan have any international support, and that's important because a process of independence without international support has little chances to, 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 to win. In the, in the Iberian Peninsula, the only case of secession that was successful, let me speak as a historian, was Portugal. And Portugal, of course, had the Eng English, the British, hmm? support. And Portugal was, in fact, almost a protectorate of the British for a long time. Hmm? The, nothing like that exists today. Uh, it's almost the opposite. As you have said, the European Union does not see uh, with, 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 a, with a good uh, eyes the, the perspective of, uh, of independence of uh, small states. Hmm? Okay, well, thank you very much for coming. I know it's a very nice day, uh, and that encourages people to stay outside. So thanks, everyone, for coming in, and thank you to all of our uh, panelists for being here and <coughs> bringing all these interesting debates to us. Thank you.